Okay, perfect. Well, welcome to see Michaela. You've been to multiple sessions mm -hmm. now, Nancy. Welcome to your first uh, during this training is action series. We're grateful to have you as always. Um, we are so excited to have Karen Robinson here with us. She is phenomenal and I have loved connecting with her throughout my career entering into human rights and human rights education. She leads out the human rights education at RFK Human Rights. Um, and she works with schools all over the nation to to incorporate human rights and human rights education. And I'm sure she could speak even more to this, mm -hmm. but she is really an expert in, in doing on the ground work with human rights. And I'm excited to have her here today. So Karen, thank you for being here. Um, and we're excited to learn from you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kaylee, so much for organizing this whole series, for asking me um, to be a part of it. Um, I'm I'm thrilled. Um, and we are a small group. So, you know, I thought what we could do is basically have a conversation about adv advocacy campaigns. And if my brain's a little loopy, it's been a loopy day for me. Michaela, I hear you're really swamped. And today has been really busy for me. And I told Kayla, I'm like, okay, refocus. Um, but we'll have a conversation about advocacy campaigns. Talk a bit about what, what you hope to, like, are you involved in the advocacy campaign now? Is there something you want to focus on? Uh, maybe dive into some of your questions and then we can touch on some key aspects of campaigns, whether, you know, regardless of what kind of campaign. Um, and if we want to today, we could start to can maybe dive into that a bit more or just lay the groundwork and then perhaps uh, revisit that another time, uh, whether it's another session with HRUSA, or if any of you want to just connect in a smaller group outside of this, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, for me, the idea of advocacy campaigns and people really thoughtfully creating campaigns to create long-term sustainable uh, structural and systemic change is critical. So the more we can work together, um, whether it's our issue area or not, to really help each other um, in our, our effort um, to create campaigns and, and engage in them and um, that I'm all for it and I'm, I'm here. <laughs> uh, so it would be really helpful for me. Uh, I'll just do a little bit more about myself and I'd love to, to hear a bit more about all of you. Nancy, I know so well, Nancy, I would say has been one of my mentors when I started in the HRE space. Um, Nancy was one of the key leaders and I've learned so much from her. So it's so great to see you, Nancy. Um, but my name is it Karen Robinson. It works both ways. It works both ways. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, my name is Karen Robinson. I am at RK uh, Human Rights Now. Before that, and where I really got my start in human rights was Amnesty International USA. I started as a deputy director um, in the Mid-Atlantic and so did work on the amnesty campaigns um, and, and really kind of cut my teeth on human rights advocacy there. Um, went on to work with the HRE program at uh, Amnesty International and then RFK. Um, throughout it, I would say core driving pieces for me have always been um, my faith. I'm a birthright Quaker, kind of that idea of who I am in society has always been really important to me. Um, and a really strong belief that despite some of the challenges with the human rights framework, um, I believe when we really come down to the very simplistic terms of the base of what we're talking about, it's it's something that we need desperately, whether that's through human rights education or advocacy campaigns. And um, so that's kind of a bit about me and I'd love to learn a bit more about you and, and, and why this session and what's of interest specifically for you. Michaela, why don't you go first? Thank you. Um, so I am currently a, a student at the University of San Francisco and I'm in their master's program, um, specifically their human rights education program. Um, I'm about to graduate this coming up spring and I'm 95% sure that I'll return to USF for the doctoral program as soon as I'm done with my master's. Um, but it's just such a passion of mine, anything that's human rights, human rights ed. Um, I feel like I live, breathe, and eat this stuff just in my small circle, in class, conversations that I have with others, including my family and loved ones. 
Um, this course or this topic specifically interests me because I've always wondered how campaigns either work or how they look. Um, there is one girl that I follow that does a lot of amazing work up and down the coast for farm workers, which is another passion of mine. And she does a lot of different social media campaigns and just campaigns or food drives or drives in general. And I've just always wondered kind of how all of that works. Um, hopefully one day I can do my own, but that's why I'm here. And I'm eager and excited to hear and learn from everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining. It's nice to meet you. Nassim? Yes, sorry, I prefer to not turn on the camera. It's more comfortable for me. Uh, so I'm Nassim. I'm uh, from Iran, living in Canada, in Montreal. I moved here um, 10 years ago and haven't uh, gone back because um, I'm involved in activism for women's rights and uh, it's not a good idea to go back. Um, and my, I don't know if I'd say that personal or so I do activism and I work for a nonprofit, uh, which is, uh, which work is focused on um, providing training on advocacy in field for women inside Iran. So for the uh, for my work, for the job that I do, I prefer to not share um, much details. I, um, I'm sure that you understand due to some uh, security issues. I'm sure that here is safe, but we are get used to that, to not share details. Uh, but for my activism, I'm more than happy to share uh, everything <laughs> and get advice from you. So I focus more on that. Uh, that's um, for recent years, I'm more focused uh, to work on the rights of women in incarcerated women so mostly when it comes to incarcerated women in iran most of the time because of the large number of political prisoners that's the first uh group that people focus the most but i'd rather to focus for both groups political and non-political um but for the past a um, couple of, more than a couple of months, actually. It's more than a year now. That's, I don't know if you've heard of the women right freedom, women life freedom movement inside Iran, the nationwide uprising. Yeah, some people um, call it as a revolution. Uh, so the number of incarcerated women raised significantly. So an estimation is that around four to five uh, thousand women were incarcerated uh, related to the protests and uh, um, so all the no names are not public uh, due to fears and terror inside the country but I was able to I started gathering the names with some of the um, women's rights activists in exile the names and information which were public on uh, those arrested. Uh, but now I'm working on that database. It's just me working on that database. So uh, that's the main thing that I'm focusing on now. And um, yeah, that's all for now. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. I'm here partly because I wanted to learn from Karen, which I always do, but it just happens that this week I've been working on getting, uh, I've been heading up a group that is a human rights education in the USA is going to make its first youth in action for human rights award this year. And we're down to our finalists and my, my job, I don't vote on that committee, but I'm sort of like the secretary and my job was to check all the references. And I'll just say that one of the interesting debates that we're having is uh, from looking at the, the people who applied, should we, how, how much weight should we give to students who are doing an advocacy, advocacy project completely on their own or doing it 
in the mm -hmm. context of a larger organization, such as uh, that, that we, there are several uh, nominations from groups that are working with larger organizations. And one of the things I've been hearing is that from the, the referees is that they feel that the organizations are teaching them skills that they're then using for the things that they care about. Mm. I keep hearing this from, from these people who are, of course, representing the organizations, but they're also pointing out how they've been given these sub certain advocacy skills, and then they're, they've become advocates for other things than what the organization was working on, which is really great to hear. And so I'm very interested in what those skills are, because it seems so important, especially for young people who can go in wrong directions or lose a human rights perspective, you know, they get angry or they get excited. So I'm really eager to to hear hear an expert because I think it's something that some of these groups that work with young people really probably need to hear more of. Did we just lose Paula? I'm done. There. I think we did. Okay. Oh, I, I don't, I think, guess she's gone. Um, thank you. And if there's light behind, I had to move rooms because the, my office, the light was shaking. So if that becomes a problem, just let me know. Um, well, thank you all. Kayla, do you want to introduce more of yourself? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, her, does her mean her? Give me one second, okay. Um, sorry. Her, her name? Yes, her name is Karen. Um, no, okay, her no give me one second. Okay. Okay. That's her. Okay. Um, I totally get it. Nancy and I were talking. Our daughters, our children are older, but I still remember those days. We didn't have Zoom, thankfully, because it would have been very um, tricky. Um, well, thank you all for your introductions and for sharing a bit more about who you are and why you're here. Um, and before we get into the actual nuts and bolts of our session tonight, I'd like to ask everyone just to kind of take a center, second and just kind of center yourself, center um, to your you, your your breathing, your heart, your you know, just center in on who you are, how you're feeling. Just take a breath. Think about how important you are in this work and think about the relationships that you have, the relationships you're building, the strength and importance of those relationships as we seek to create change, meaningful change in our communities, however we define community. as all the craziness swirls, swirls around us in this world, the, the negative from Maine to the Middle East, to Iran, to so many places. Um, just know that as we do this work, we're, not, we're never alone. Although we may feel like it sometimes, we're not. So center on the thought that we are in a community that loves each other and supports each other. Thank you. All right. So ready to dive in. Um, so the, in, in your introductions, you talked about a couple of different advocacy campaigns that you're aware of. And I, you know, for me, the thing that's always tricky about advocacy campaigns and, and thinking about them and creating them is really kind of that starting point, right? To, to A, be really um, clear about what is it that you care about and that you want to focus on and how educated and, and knowledgeable are you on that issue? Um, because when we think uh, often um, of developing a campaign or we're like, I care about farm workers, I care about this issue, you know, I care about education, um, 
it's overwhelming, right? There's so much in, in any one space. Um, and so the number one key skill that I, I think is so critical is really goal development, developing your goals, defining your goals, and really being clear to the clear with that. Like how many of us love goal setting? I, I think it's really awesome. But so that's a good, like, have you done work where you've set some really clear goals? Like clear goal with an outcome, whether for an advocacy, whether for a campaign or something else. Can you explain or share an example or an experience you've had in setting that up, doing goal setting? I just interviewed a group today in California working on reparations for people that formerly inherit people, descendants of formerly enslaved people. And they have a very clear goal, and they want to have a representative in every county in California. So it's measurable, but it's a huge state. So I, I was a little nervous about their goal because it's so hard to find a young person for every county, but it's clear. It just seemed to me a little unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. We're well, anybody else? Other, other, um, because I'll share so because it's interesting, Nancy. I'm having that experience with some of our young leaders too, right? Other, yep, Nassim. Yes, for the work that I'm doing, my goal a uh, couple of months ago, maybe since July, was to um, gather a certain number of names and information and then submit a report to the fact finding mission on Iran. Uh, that was established in the UN, and the next uh, along the way, I was thinking about, for example, it actually that changed that goal. What uh, at certain points I was thinking about publishing two or three short articles in Farsi media, for example, within six months. Okay, so so this is a great example. So Nassim, is your goal to write the reports or is your goal to inform to, to inform and, and inform a certain audience about what's going on? Yeah, that's more like an objective. Yes, this is your yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm yeah, that's a good question. I need to work on the goal. Uh that's what's achievable. I want to go beyond informing, actually. It's more like, at this point, it's more like documentation. Uh, and for uh, maybe truth-seeking goals, but uh, I need to work on that. Yeah. Michaela, do you have any um, experiences? Um, not necessarily, per se. Um what I'm working on right now and what I'm presenting at the conference is about um, basically a crisis for farm worker families along the central coast of California, since, since that's where I'm from. I grew up um, surrounded by agriculture fields and a lot of my peers were ostracized um, growing up for their basic needs not being met or hygiene. And a lot of that stems from like the housing crisis not only is it hard to get housing in general <clears throat> within like the Monterey, Santa Cruz area, um, but it's even harder for farm workers. So as of 2016, there's about a little over 94,000 um, farm workers within that region. Um, and as of now, about 40, as of 2022, as of 46,000 um, are currently employed within the farm worker agriculture area, but there's a lot of, you know, when it comes to measuring how many farm workers there are, just any farm worker data in general, it can get um, kind of fuzzy due to documentation status. And so I'll be presenting basically on the goal of hoping to advocate for more funding for housing. Not only that, but also there are resources in the area. However, the ratio of farm workers to those resources is far and wide. And so I'm advocating for more resources as well, just to be spread out. Um, and also just advocating for safer and better housing conditions right across the street from my house, actually where I grew up, there was a family that was um, 
cited for having over over 100 farm workers and over 60 families living in greenhouses um, and charging them between $1,000 to $2,000 for rent um, to live there. And so there's a lot of that going on back home. Um, and it's kind of, everyone kind of turns a blind eye. So it's there and people know about it, but not much is kind of being done that, or it's moving very slowly. And so I'm just trying to bring attention. That's really the goal um, is to just bring attention and whoever, you know, is there at the conference or finds the information useful, like by all means, please use it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now in terms of like advocacy work and kind of like mini campaign hopefully yeah so um so what do you think when you think about your goals I, I would you know and, and I think to what you just mentioned Nancy like it is fine to have a long-term goal but to be really clear about the steps you need to get there and I apologize I told Kayla I have a power uh, a slide deck that I just uh, today again I lost today for a variety of reasons so I'm happy to share it to the to with you afterwards it kind of frames this a bit more so I, I apologize but, I, you know, I think clarity of goal, um, long and short term, really is the framework for any ca advocacy campaign that you're going to do. And understanding within that, um, so if you're going to use, you want um, to the ho housing for farm workers, right? So you, like, you can have a big goal for that, but maybe midterm goals are going to be, um, or shorter term goals are going to be about kind of building the awareness, like what are the steps that are that you need to put in place to actually reach that big, that long-term goal, the bigger goal um, is fine, right? I, I always think of my campaign work as kind of one of those old train stations, right? I don't know, you probably may <laughs> never know, but at New York, Penn Station used to go and like your departure would be up here and then when your train went, everything shifted up, right? All oh, the next trains came. And that's what this work is like, right? You have, you ultimately want to get to this destination. And when one thing goes, everything's going to shift a little bit. And that's what you need when you're doing campaign work to be flexible, right? To be really um, understand kind of the contingencies that can happen around the work. Um, so goal point number one, so the first thing you need to be able to do is really set clear goals with outcomes. Um, and then to really be thinking about who has the power to make this happen, right? Who has the power? If you're thinking about um, farm workers and housing, right? Is that combination um, statewide and local, right? Being clear about even very specific in the district of Monterey, is there a housing authority um, and who is that director, right? The tighter you can get on your on the decision maker, who you need to focus on, uh, the stronger your campaign will be because you have a really clear target, right? That you want to get to. Um, and this is whether you're doing something kind of really large or something, you know, some people, um, advocacy campaigns can be kind of smaller scale, whatever. There's always someone who has the power to create the change. Um, so when you think about, um, kind of the ideas you have right now, who is that person? Do you, do you have an idea of who has the ability to bring about the change or and or who are the key obstacles, right? Who doesn't want farmers to have, like who, who wants to maintain the status quo, right? And I would say follow the money, um, but who has the power and who's the obstacle, right? Mm -hmm. So in your work right now, who do you who who are you seeing as the the power person or persons um, and op and the obstacle? Um, and if we can't answer these all now, this is this is kind of what we need to. That's the process kind of we need to go through. Sorry, Michaela, go ahead. Um. So I haven't done any like looking into who exactly. From my own knowledge, I do know that a lot of it has to do with money coming into the county. And the problem is, is that this specific sector of, like, I guess, yeah, it falls under some wild name, but basically housing and anything grassroots or nonprofit kind of gets like the very small six or 16%, while everything else, especially schools, gets about like, I believe schools in the area get about 61%. However, I've been trying to search for a breakdown 
of how these like how our tax money is allocated to these specific areas because if you're familiar with Monterey or Carmel those two areas fall underneath Monterey County now if you go to those areas and you look at their schools if you look at just the demographics or the area in general it's going to be much wider much cleaner um, much nicer and the further you go in which a lot of people don't know especially because tourism is very very large within Santa Cruz and Monterey is that if you go further in there's a lot of farm workers a lot of farm working farm working families and so it it makes me wonder that's where I'm trying to find out where the money's going <laughs> um but it makes me wonder where exactly that money is going and how it's being allocated and who is doing I guess the allocating just mm-hmm. because the drastic difference in not even a 15 to 20 minute drive is very wild to me um and so that's kind of where I've been trying to do my digging and I do know there are quite a bit of HOA um like different districts and different sectors I think the problem is is the reason why they're not also building a lot of I guess farm worker housing too is because we also are in a community with CSUMB so Cal State Monterey Bay has a large um student homeless population and so it's kind of like I speak to my mom about it because she still lives there and um, it's really hard because it's either we build housing for farm workers and then students are mad or families of students are mad because they're wondering why their students that actually pay to go to school aren't getting the housing whilst farm workers when it comes to immigration and immigration policies we do have some red and some blue there when it comes to politics so then it becomes a political thing and then it becomes a racial thing Um, and so I'm I'm really trying to kind of target, I guess, like the money portions and that since that's always been a large issue in these two communities is even though they both have very large tourism um, throughout the year and especially during summertime, it's kind of like, where is everything going if these areas and these places look nice, but the rest of the area doesn't. Um, So that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. So it's interesting because I also hear as an obstacle in that is what might actually be kind of the manufactured manufactured conflict for housing between the students and the farm workers. You know, again, like both need housing, but somebody is making the decision, right, on 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 how to provide housing and is creating a, a conflict between two communities in need, right? And I think when, when, as you develop this out, the question is, does that have to be there or is that manufactured by the folks who are benefiting from that dynamic, right? So if you have, if you have, I think it's hard, yeah. Okay, the military too. That you you got a lot going on there. Um, But as you dig into that, that's that's something to look at, right? Because often when we're doing campaigns and we're trying to advance, um, you know, communities who are often marginalized, I think the reparation faces the same challenge, right? You have someone who's making the decision that will that will create a conflict between two groups that both deserve um, or that there's a right that needs to be wronged. but that but that's manufactured so that the status quo maintains it. And again, I always say and follow the money. Um, but yeah, that's that's another layer with the military. Um, Nassim, how about you? Well, in my case, I have to think about it more thoroughly, but I think that I cannot uh just name one person, or even I cannot uh, say the government of Iran or anyone in the system, in the uh, judiciary system in Iran. That's actually, at least that's not my uh, goal. Um, maybe the, the public and the human rights organizations, international organizations, and uh, transnational organizations but uh, yeah it's hard it's hard yours is hard because right what you're trying to do I mean it's it's very much more awareness and and trying to get folks to join you and that's kind of another that's the other piece 
um, as you're developing your campaign, that's critically important, right? Who can you get to support you, right? Who are your allies? Who, who also has skin in this game um, that you want on your side? So Michaela, in your case, like how could you start a conversation among, and I'm just using this because you, you mentioned it, but like students and farm workers, right? How can you start conversations among groups that should be striving for the same end goal as far as affordable housing and adequate standard of living. Um, and in, in Nis Nassim, you know, in your case, it's it's how can you get the international community? Who are those key players? But the hard, like the hard challenge, and one of the things I learned at working at Amnesty, like there's some countries that it's, you just have to keep a light shining on them, right? Iran is not going to release Nazreen, right, is someone I've worked with. Um, she's not going to get released anytime soon. Um, but how do we keep uh, aware, building awareness, keeping the light, the candle shining, right, on governments that that may not change right away? Um, and so what are the, you know, who else can join you in that effort is, is kind of the next stage in building out your campaign strategy. Does that make sense? Yes, also, um, I think uh, that's not only about awareness raising for me. I have to think about that more because I think the lag is more in the, uh, that's kind of related uh, to each other, but it's more on the documentation part maybe. And um, because for awareness raising, media is very much involved. But for long-term projects, they're less interested. And even for the activists, they're less interested if they need to work on something for, to just focus on something, especially when there are a lot of uh, violence is going and um, everything is, there are a lot of things that kind of sometimes, I think maybe distract people, their effort. And uh, I have to s decide that I want to focus on awareness raising, documentation, and then I think I can choose between what part of the community I want to connect to women's rights movements, to smaller groups who are working on the rights of incarcerated people, or what. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So it's so still kind of identifying, really clarifying that that mm -hmm. unique goal for you. Nancy, any thoughts or reflections? Yes. When you asked the question to about who are your allies, this group again, I just was I spent an hour with them about an hour <laughs> ago, so they're on my mind. So this is a group of entirely African Americans, and one of the ways they're doing the documentation is going around. They want to capture the voices of people who are unheard. And so they're they're going to public housing, they're going to encampments of unhoused people. But surprisingly, one of their allies in their work have been the Japanese American groups because they in their turn have done a lot of interviews, especially with elders of documentation of what effects their incarceration during World War II had. And so they have actually learned a lot and found a lot of support from the Japanese American community that had no idea, but they sort of heard about what they were doing and they've given them some, some really good ideas and some, they haven't actually done formal skill training, but they've really learned a lot from them, which they had no idea to, to expect. That's awesome, right? And that's so important that you never know until you start to really, thoughtfully and intentionally engage in your campaign uh, design, the, like who's going to be with you? Oops, sorry, something's crawling on my, we're, we have an infestation of, of ladybugs here, sorry. <laughs> um, so to the exact, yeah. So, but to this point uh, and, and bringing on allies and other people to do this work, you know, the community mapping is critically important, right? Because you get a sense of, of who's there, who's not there, kind of where, where those opportunities are. 
a critical piece with the this p with bringing more people on board is to make sure that they are aligned with your goal right it always comes back to your goal um, because one of the challenges when you start to bring other folks on board to help advance your campaign is that if that you may get conflicting agendas right that um, you may have a group that comes in and says yeah yeah I really want to work with um, farm worker housing, but I also really, really wanna work on X, Y, Z, right? And and if you work with the students as well, like are you working on housing writ large or are, is there a space when a group um, ultimately has their own agenda and, and their own goals that they're gonna not support kind of that bigger long-term goal. So always being clear, and I think it's critical just to have your goals and objectives up front all the time as we engage with others to help it move the work forward. So that's kind of a, a critical thing. And, um, and and sometimes that's it, relationship building for the people that are in San Francisco area. If you ever have a chance, uh, Michaela, you're there and you may have met a woman by the name of Mona Kadena. Um, she works with Equal Justice USA, and I know Nancy. And Nancy, if you've worked with Mona, I know you? who she is. No, not yeah. directly. I certainly know who she is. Yeah. If you ever want to talk with a campaigner who is advocacy campaigner, who is probably the best in the business, it's Mona Kadena. She works for Equal Justice USA. She's based in the Bay Area, um, and she's she's phenomenal. When she worked at Amnesty, she, she worked on death penalty, which is not an easy thing to work on. Um, and she just had a big win in, in California. And I'll, I, if I get your email addresses, I'll send that to you. And Michaela, I'll do an intro. Um, and Nancy, if you want an intro to Mona is phenomenal and is always, um, always ready to kind of support others in moving social justice, human rights forward. It's Mona Kadena. Um, so find finding these folks, making sure that we're we're all, all on the same page when you bring in allies and co-conspirators to help advance the campaign. And then the next piece is tactics. And I think the challenge for us as we do campaigns is that often we jump right to tactics, right? How, who let's have a letter writing campaign? Are we gonna like do a teach-in? Are we gonna do uh, a mass protest? Are we gonna right? Tactics only come after we're really clear about our goal and who we're going after, right? Because your tactic, if you're going after one person, um, maybe letter writing is the best way to get to them. A mass protest may not get there. I mean, it, they'll, they'll know you're doing it, but that may not be the best way to, to, to get their attention in a, in a intentional way and structured way. Um, so just exploring with your tactics, and this is where, and I will send this to you as well, really understanding movement ecology is so important, right? Understanding there's tactics and then there's kind of these layers of tactics, right? So do you need someone that's in the inside game, right? Do you need someone, Michaela, who's in the government of Monterey that is part of your, your campaign, that's working with you to achieve this, right? Someone that's in there, um, in those meetings, um, officially, right? Inside game is is really important. And I wouldn't say that's necessarily the tactic, but it's part of kind of a movement ecology that we should be thinking about as we develop and design our campaigns. What are there some tactics that you've been involved in, in maybe a campaign that you've worked on or that you would like to include in what you're thinking about now? I think that is definitely one of them. Um, currently, I live in the Bay Area, but I do plan on moving back, um, depending on if I go into the doctoral program or not. But I do plan on moving back, and I'm hoping to um, either work kind of at a nonprofit that, or a grassroots, or some type of office that aligns with kind of farm workers, immigration, and documented status, and things like that. But also kind of finding that in and I haven't done that just because I'm not in the area and I would like to be when you know when and if I get my hands into the nitty-gritty but that's kind of always been my goal was to find kind of an in whether that's through some 
from someone through housing or um, there's a lot of just different resources and those resources mainly are nonprofit groups. Um, so finding an in somewhere there and then going from there, but definitely taking it kind of, yeah, like you were explaining kind of steps in layers. And that's definitely one of my steps um, a little bit further on down the road. Great. I know one tactic, Karen, that I've really appreciated and found very effective when done well um, and done mindfully is digital storytelling. Um, I think that in the new age, especially depending on the the size and scale of your advocacy, I've the more that we've brought in voices and, and storytelling into the campaign, I've found is a little bit more effective in terms of where we're able to get it to go or who we're able to get on board. Um, so, but when done well and done mindfully and trauma informed. So I think there's like a very, <laughs> sorry, a caveat there, but when I've seen it done really well, it's very impactful for a potential campaign. Absolutely. Other thoughts? I'll just mention, and Michaela, you perhaps know this group. Uh, there is a group in San Francisco called Voice of Witness, and they are a oral history group, and they teach oral history gathering in an ethical and appropriate way and how to use oral history. It's just what you're saying, Kaylee, uh, as, as there, it's evidence but it's, it's also real people and real stories. This group I've been mentioning who are trying to uh, work on reparations in California, they've been collecting stories, but they don't have, have the technique to turn them into something. For instance, Voice of Witness often will publish books and, some, and it's often in textbook form, which is very interesting, I think. Nice. I might also mention when, again, I'm, I'm so full of these <laughs> I've been interviewing groups and groups and groups. Uh, one group that, that was working in a high school in LA, and they wanted to make their high school more uh, ecologically sound, and they uh, zero, you know, as good as it was. And th they went in about four years ago to the administration, very, they did that very skillfully and got some commitments. But the tactic I think that's been really impressive to me is that they are holding the administration to what they said they do and mm -hmm. they meet regularly and they say and and i th th now again this is not my observation but they're the responder the uh, the referees were just saying it's amazing they're tactful they know how to do it right but they're saying but you said we would have only you know uh compostable plastics from now on so just that persistency to come back and ask for uh accountability from people who've made commitments it, it's that's a it's such a it's so brilliant but often we just kind of throw our hands up right or just forget but that's thank you nancy that's so important other thoughts for me i think if i decide to focus on documentation i can use research and training of uh, trainers, TOTs, mm -hmm. to expand the group. And uh, as Nancy said, oral history, my background is in history, so you can use that as well. That's great. And, you know, and, and the, the challenge that I, you know, and I'm older school, so like I think social media offers us so many opportunities, but also, so many pitfalls you know this kind of um the uh what's it called performative act like the activism is what does your instagram photo look like and what did i put on my like i think that that's a, a tricky thing to to navigate right so my daughters are 21 and pretty socially active and i'm always kind of watching how they engage with their community and how they engage with issues they care about. And sometimes they call me out for being like, mom, you don't get it. And sometimes I call them out when they post something about a demonstration. And then I'm like, well, what is that leading to? Like, what, like, like, are you doing something else to create the change or did you just go hang out on the quad? And like, 
so I, I think that, or did you just like press a button and say, I took action, I took action, right? And and trying to, as you're developing your campaign, think about how social media um, can, can help because it is a powerful tool um, and as a tactic could be really helpful. Um, but just being aware of the limitations I think is important. Um, and I'm learning, I'm gonna actually take a course on it because I feel like I'm constantly learning about social media um, as an older person. Um, but tactics are really important. And as you get into the work um, and maybe what we're talking about now, um, and I'm actually gonna stop for a second because we have a new person has joined us. Is it Mayo? Are you able to introduce yourself or are you just, do you want to just listen? I'm good either way. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, good morning uh, from uh, Lima. Uh, my name is Niu Nito. So I'm currently working as a uh, uh, child rights uh, uh, lawyer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I'm working as a child rights uh, lawyer in Lima, like a uh, Baba. Yeah, I'm from Lima. Yeah, it's very nice to, to see all of you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've kind of been moving through the agenda quickly since it's a small group of people. Um, so what we've been talking about is really um, what do we need? to create an advocacy campaign. And so walking through key components and, and the steps in really designing. Um, so just as a quick update, setting clear goals and outcomes, really defining what those are, understanding who your target is, um, who can really help bring about, or who has the power to bring about the change that you're seeking and who else is, might be an obstacle. And in this one, I always say, follow the money is my, underlying <laughs> always follow the money and, and I think you'll get someplace. Um, the next component is really finding help. Who else can help you with the work, help um, bring about the change that you're seeking? Are they allies, co-conspirators? Who are these people? And just making sure that whoever comes on board with you is also striving to reach that same goal, right? That you don't have conflicting agendas that ultimately may break down the campaign. And then we just finished talking about tactics, um, using legal mechanisms, um, legal uh, regional courts is also really valuable. Um, and I don't know if you want to share anything that you're working on now, or if you have any questions about any of that. Mayim? Yes. Uh, firstly, I, I'm so sorry, uh, I'm very late uh, to join this session. Because uh in in Yuma, this is very early morning, so uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, uh yeah, actually say like uh I, I like it very much about the advocacy, but during uh, as you know in Yuma, there's a like a coup uh uh that this is just not a coup in Yuma, so that's why we are quite difficult uh, and also very challenges uh to make a advocacy, so that's why I want to I uh, know like how to uh like uh make it a focusy for the children particularly yes i'm working in the sunrise uh, uh i work as a uh, advocate so that's why I, I want to know how to make like the advocacy like that during the the, the coup in lima so there's a lot of like the um, china violation in across the country uh, there's so many yeah, as you may be aware or not i'm not quite sure in lima situation so, uh, the, the, but uh, 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 as you mentioned about like the regional code in Lima, uh, that's it, the, 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 the like uh, national code and also regional. Regional means it, like in, in our regional is ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN is not very much like affected, not very much uh, strong in the, time, uh, the human rights and also uh, time rights. Uh, so it, it's a quite uh, challenges to make advocacy like uh, in 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 Yuma, just now when we are doing the advocacy, uh, doing the making the high profile, there's a lot of like uh, threats uh, to uh, make a prosecution because there are not much 
uh, allowed to make the human rights uh, advocacy campaign. But uh, we are like thinking about how to make like uh, as possible as we can uh, to uh, make it advocacy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is like uh, just like the situation in Lima, uh, just like brief. But uh, uh, I'm like quite interested in uh, uh, what uh, you um, mentioned about, okay, as uh, how, how um, making the advocacy like tactic, like different tactic, yeah, maybe like different uh, situation we need to consider, we need to think in uh, how to make like uh, chain as possible as we can, yeah. Uh, by different uh, means uh, according to the situation, yeah. Yeah, and I, it, I, and I'm and i happy to spend more time with you. Maybe we over email, we could work through um, the details a bit more. Um, but I think the first thing is to, to definitely, okay, oh, bye. Um, to be clear about, about the goal that you, you really are aiming to achieve, um, because to say human rights advocacy campaign is pretty big, right? So what within that um, do you do you really want to focus on, right? What is the the goal that you're trying to reach? And again, we could I can spend um, time with you offline too to help develop that a bit more if you'd like. Um, but that that's kind of the starting point um, to to kind of really frame anything that you want to do, the work that you want to do. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Um, and then the last component of all of this is to really set a timeline and a budget. Because one of the other challenges, and Nancy, I think some like I found this working with youth, um, youth campaigners that I've worked with in the last few years, they get so excited about this idea and they want they have a clear goal and they have their plan, but then it's like, okay, you need a timeline and a budget, right? Because at the end of the day, like you really want to be clear, and I'm sure none of the young people you're judging, I'm sure they have this. Um, but for all of us, I think to have a timeline, right? Because um, some of this work could go on indefinitely. And maybe your long-term goal is, you know, a few years. But um, to be clear about what you want to accomplish by when and what is it going to cost you? Because uh, there that's that's part of what you need. Like you need to really consider um, realistically what is needed to achieve your goal. So Nassim, if you're, you know, want to do research and then capture the documentation, right? Are, is there a cost to that? Like the, the time that you can reach people, um, just an important factor that I think often kind of gets forgotten because we get into, um, this idea of all of this, but when we have a tactic that's a mass protest, right? Like budget that out. What is that going to cost you? Um, so you know whether it's a realistic tactic or or not. Um, and then, and that's really pretty straightforward. And then the final piece, the final part of all of this is after you take action to celebrate, right? I think that in this work, we so often um, are just nose to the grind, we just do the work and we don't stop enough to celebrate. One of the great things about HRUSA is the celebrating of, of people and organizations and of youth now um, who are doing this work. We need to stop and celebrate one another, celebrate our work. If you have a kid, just reckon, even if you didn't quite reach your goal, be really appreciative and, and full of grace for what you've been able to do. If you have put together a whole campaign, and even if you only get part way through, like that is an accomplishment, right? Every step forward is moving us in the right direction. Um, and step back then and take time to assess, right? If you did not achieve your goal, what, what didn't work, right? Did you have were you going after the wrong person? Was that person really not the one who could bring about the change we needed? Was it the wrong tactic? When I started at Amnesty, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I remember someone telling in an, when I was a deputy director at an early meeting, there was a case, I wanna say it was in Bhutan, and the king really loved basketball. And so they got some NBA players to write to him. And that that helped, right? You never know right? But you need to um, 
be open to a lot of ideas. And maybe that was just, you know, amnesty myth. I don't know, but I love that story. And, and, and if it doesn't work, assess, figure out why and reboot, right? But always take time for self-care and centering um, in this process because it's heavy work. Um, it's uh, long work, um, but very necessary. Um, and so always be thinking about uh, celebrating regardless of where we end and start again. Um, so those are kind of the key components. Um, I will send the frame to you. I actually did a um, training, Mona, Kadina and I, uh, Marissa um, from Arte. The three of us did a youth engagement, uh, a youth uh, campaign session. So I'll send that to all of you. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't have it done before. I just was <laughs> life. Um, and then also the bit on movement ecology, because I think that that's really important in understanding how how you map that into the work we're doing. Um, so that's kind of what I had today for us. Any thoughts, questions, or reflections? Um, I have a question, and, and I have to go shortly because... Uh, I live in an old people's home and they feed us early and I have to cook <laughs> my dinner. But um, one of the things I've observed in, in these interviews with youth uh, activists is that they're, these are high school kids. And mm -hmm. the timeline, when you talk about the timeline, there you know, you lose the leaders every year. The seniors graduate. And it seems to me the ones that are most successful are cultivating the next crop, even as they get ready to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a continual problem. Uh, but I think that that in advocacy, keeping keeping your your supply line of, of advocates is really important. Sometimes it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I find that they're they're they've had some interesting strategies to keep it going. Yeah. Especially with high school kids, they have many interests. They they get interested in field hockey so they're less able to do whatever it was they were doing before yeah but it's interesting that the successful ones are mindful about keeping more you know filling in the gaps when people graduate absolutely kind of that transitional leadership and ensuring that that's there and mapping that into your strategy absolutely you know and one thing that i always say to young people in particular, but I think this applies to all of us, is to just be really aware of bandwidth, right? And not to be, and this is something that I, I'll go back to my daughters. I say to them, don't get mad at someone if they're not interested in the same things you are, if they're not like engaged as much as you are, right? Like we all only have so much bandwidth and we should be comfortable with people being fully present in that space and not to um, shame or make someone feel bad if they're not in your space with you, right? And that that's part of like understanding who our allies and co-conspirators are, really finding those finding those people so that um so that 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 group is committed. And absolutely, Nancy, like building that the layers of leadership so that the work continues. Um, which is why I like to work with teachers in schools, right? Because it is a constant, right? And if you really find that educator in a school who really is all about education through human rights, investing in those young people, um, that is one strategy. It's not the only, but it's one, definitely. Karen, thank you so much. I'm sorry to be to leave early, but oh, I have it's to okay. <laughs> you. It's you. nice to see you, Nancy. So I look forward to getting that. that yep, absolutely. That. Thank you. So do folks have any, I mean, that, you know, I, I kind of plan for us having breakout groups and having more conversation, but any thoughts or questions or reflections on this? And Mayo, if I can send, I'm going to put my email address in here um, and happy to kind of chat more um, regarding developing out a campaign. Um, unless you have other questions questions about that right now. Yes, no. <laughs> I stop people. 
Nassim, where are you in Canada? I'm in Montreal. Sorry, I was writing down your uh, email address as well. <laughs> My family's on the West Coast um, in BC. Mm -hmm. So the weather is better there. <laughs> but did this all make sense? And do you have questions? I mean, it's what I love about creating an advocacy campaign is that um, it really, it really is. You can. It's so fun to kind of put the pieces together. Like when you know your goal and know what you're really striving for, then it's kind of like you're building this 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 strategy that you, that you can see manifest itself in that. Like when you take action, and it's um, I just find it to be so much fun. And whether you know, regardless of the issue or the topic or the space, whether it's local or global or um. The, the same components apply. And I think if you if we're disciplined in how we really um, stay tight to those, we have more success. So of course, and it will be much more effective. The whole goal is that I think. And it's I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank you very much. So my work is on this. I mean my day job. Um, I'm more organizing, I'm not uh, teaching this stuff, but I'm exposed to it a lot. But when it comes to my work, I don't really take the time to sit down and think about all these aspects because uh, sometimes on a daily basis, we just listen to the news and react and listen to the news yeah. and react. Yeah. Well, it's hard not to, right? But um, I mean, I'm Kayla does a lot with uh, measurement and evaluation, right? Same thing. The more we can pre like be thoughtful in our planning, and that mm -hmm. includes like um, including how do we measure success, which I forgot mm -hmm. to mention, right? And if we factor that in in the in the front end, then then we can be more successful. And I but I, I agree, like I you know, there's so much clouding our space we just want to do something right we want to do something um mm -hmm. but if we do without thought and intention you know either you know we run the risk of either not having any impact or having the wrong impact right good intentions mm -hmm. are not enough when it comes to creating the type of sustainable change that we want um that advances human rights and social justice sure. right? so but yeah but I'm I'm happy. I will um, send out, um, and or I can get it to Kayla. Maybe it can be on the site. Um, please email me. I believe deeply in this work, and I believe deeply in being in community with folks um, wherever we are. I appreciate and that. We'll do whatever I can to be a, a support and um, and not have you by yourself. So <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm sure that you're very busy, but. Uh... That's very generous. Thanks. <laughs> this, is our, this is our life's work. So, yeah. And thank you, Kaylee. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was just going to say next week's session, if you can be there, we're going to be diving into contacting influential figures. So okay. uh, that's a big piece of what we talked about today. So piggybacking mm -hmm. off of that is, okay, how do we contact them? Who are we contacting? And really diving into that. Um, piece of Karen's presentation. So if you will be there and if you're interested in that, that'll be next week. Um, just wanted to pitch that because I think it does yes. really sense pairing Thanks. with what we talked about today. Yeah. And I'd love to know more about the how to measure success that you just mentioned. It will be in the PowerPoints or we'll have, yeah, the yeah. material that you're going to share. Yeah. Thanks. Because each component, when we when we do our campaigning workshops with youth, each component we spend like a at least one session on defining goals, um, mm -hmm. identifying uh, the points of power. Right. So yeah, we do a whole session on each component typically. Um, so that that will be in that. But there's so many rich materials on this. I've called some that I like. Um, and I can include that in, in what I put out. Um, and there's just, there's Perfect. a lot, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I hope this was helpful. And thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. For inviting me in.
please reach out um, with anything.